Hi, uh, my name is Joel Kelsey. I work with Free Press, and um, I'm here to welcome you all to the, the panel about stimulus funding and the BTOP program. Um, and I would like to introduce the moderator for the panel, uh, Larry Strickling. Assistant Secretary Strickling has served as administrator of the NTI since 2009. In that role, he's managed federal spectrum policy, uh, internet governance policy, and the Herculean effort to distribute $4.7 billion in broadband grants. Prior to that, he had a very long and distinguished his history as a technology policy expert, uh, including the being the policy coordinator for Obama for America, where he oversaw two dozen domestic policy committees and was responsible for technology and telecommunications issues. And before that, he had a history at the Federal Communications Commission as chief of the, the once named Common Carrier Bureau, uh, and before that as general counsel in uh, the Competition Bureau. We're extremely excited to have, to have uh, the Assistant Secretary here to moderate this panel. Um, please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Joel. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to share the stage here with uh, four folks who are working very hard on the broadband grants that we uh, have put out last year and, and back in 2009. Um, just to give people some statistics to, to set the stage for this, um, uh, we are currently managing about 230 broadband stimulus grants um, totaling about $4 billion. Um, of those, uh, we have about $250 million being spent on what we call sustainable broadband adoption projects, and you'll hear a lot more about that from our panelists. We have $200 million um, uh, funding public computer centers, and then the remainder of the money is going to build out infrastructure across the country. Um, and we're doing this in an environment where, based on some additional work we've been doing on broadband, we know, based on the national broadband map that we released in February, that about 90 to 95 percent of Americans don't even have the ability to subscribe to broadband service at a speed that is the minimum speed the FCC has determined um, is necessary for folks to be able to access and use a basic set of, of internet applications. And that's a four megabit download speed, a one megabit upload speed. And based on the data we collected, which was availability data, not actual speed data, we're estimating about five to 10% of Americans can't even subscribe to that level of service. But, uh, but that's only part of the story. The other part of the story Story based on uh, other another study that we've been doing the last few years is to study the subscription rates in the nation um, through a, a, a census survey that we conduct each year. This past October, we surveyed about 54,000 households. It was about almost 130,000 individuals, uh, from which we learned that the adoption rate for broadband in this country is at 68 percent. So we have, you know, quite a large gap between the the number of people who could subscribe and the number of households that actually do subscribe. And while the curves are all going the right direction, the 68% represents a five percentage point increase over where we were in 2009, uh, we still have quite a gap to fill. And we have a lot of individual um, differences that seem to be persisting. So not surprisingly, rural areas lag behind urban areas, um, certain ethnic uh, and demographic cohorts lag behind others. Um, and uh, part of what we want to do with the Broadman Grant Program, and again, you'll hear from some of the folks today, is, is to understand what sorts of interventions might actually move the subscription needle for some of these groups that historically have lagged behind the national average in terms of subscribing to broadband. So um, we should have a very good discussion today. Um, we'll try to keep the focus on looking forward because while while we've put $4 billion out there, we know that's really only a tiny piece of uh, the problem that needs to be solved here. And, and I think everyone understands what's happening in Washington these, these days. The likelihood that we're going to see substantial federal funding of additional grants anytime in the near future, I think is pretty small. So we really owe it um, 
certainly at the government, we're taking our responsibility very seriously to figure out what we can learn from these projects and, and to provide guidance to those people who will want to be trying to work out these issues without the benefit of at least federal dollars. And our panelists, I know, are thinking about some of the same issues, and we'll try to spend some time exploring that this morning as well. Um, but enough from me. I think we ought to get right to our panelists. Um, in the ceremonial co coin toss we held prior to the panel starting, um, Judy DeMott, who also had a home court advantage being from Massachusetts, uh, lost the toss. And so she will be our first presenter this morning. Uh, Judy is from the Massachusetts Broadband Initiative, which is uh, um, not only uh, managing and overseeing a large grant to uh, cover the western half of Massachusetts, but she's also the designated state entity for our broadband and state broadband and broadband mapping and state broadband initiative program. So she has uh, 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 two perspectives on uh, what we're doing, both in terms of the infrastructure project that she's managing, as well as um, the work that the state is doing to collect data from carriers and to, con and to carry out some of their own initiatives through the state broadband grants that we made as well. So uh, Judy, uh, we'll let you get started. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I, I hope that my home home court advantage is, is uh, will carry the Red Sox today, given that they're 0 and 6, and we have our home opener at 2:05. Um, so, as Larry said, I'm the uh, director of the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. Uh, people get that confused all the time. We were created back in 2008 um, from Governor Patrick when he signed the broadband bill into into being, and he did that because he recognized that there was uh, the digital divide existed here in Massachusetts. And for those of you who aren't from Massachusetts, you may find that hard to believe we have, you know, such a, a technology sector, thriving sector here. We have some of the best colleges here in, in, in the eastern part of the state. But in the, the western third of Massachusetts, we have over 50 communities that lack that, that basic broadband infrastructure. They also, many of them don't even have cable. And so we have a, a real, real issue. And um, for those who know Massachusetts, you may know that uh, the folks out, out there have been trying for over a decade on their own to, to find ways, creative ways, to incent uh, private sector investment to come in and, and help close the divide. And it was actually through some of that work that, that they got to the legislature and, and the governor um, for, you know, to, to bring this to his attention and to create the uh, Mass Broadband Institute. Uh, we were capitalized with $40 million of state bond funds to try to, uh, try to make this happen. Um, and that was before the federal stimulus came came to being and so the the goal was to use that money um, to uh, catalyze private sector investment um, as I said we were we were founded in 2008 at the time that the capital markets collapsed so thankfully the federal stimulus money came came along and to date we have leveraged 25 million dollars of our state bond funds to bring in 83 million dollars of federal funds into the state We've also taken that, and because uh, part of that money, $45 million, uh, is for us to, to build that middle mile infrastructure out in Western Mass. It will actually be a 1,300 mile aerial fiber optic uh, build uh, throughout 123 communities. It's called Mass Broadband 123. Um, and uh, we'll be connecting 1,400 community anchor institutions. We recently hired a network operator, because we're an economic development agency. I, I don't want to be getting the call when uh, somebody hits a telephone pole. Uh, probably not a good idea. Uh, but the uh, in order to show the, the, the use of uh, public and private partnership, the firm that we hired, Axia uh, NGN USA, they're planning on uh, investing 35 to $45 million in Western Mass as a result of running this network and making additional, um, uh, additional investments to help build that out. So we really, we really take to heart the, the notion that, you know, a, the state can't do it alone, that we can't solely rely on the 
the federal government and the the private sector isn't going to make that that investment the the ROI for the network that we're building is 30 years and in this industry they're they're really looking at a, a return somewhere in that that three year three year range um, so that's the the first part the first part of my mission is we can talk about adoption and that's extremely important but if you don't have the ability to connect then you know adoption is uh, is moot and you know some of the things that we know out in Western Mass is just hard to even conceive of we have 27 municipal police stations that don't have access to the criminal justice information system another 85 that have access via 56k frame relay which was state of the art in the 80s but we're a little bit past that um, and so we're really looking you know to bring this infrastructure in uh, get it working in the at the community anchor institutions but then we can't stop there we have to also focus on working with those institutions to help them realize what they can do, um, how do they adopt broadband, and, and you know we don't want to just stop at basic connection. How to get the most out of out of this network? Uh, so we're focusing on that now. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to be on this panel and hear what uh, what what everyone's doing because I think uh, best practices and and talking and understanding what folks are doing is what what we all should be doing to to really leverage uh, not only the the, the federal money, but private sector investment that uh, that's come in. Larry mentioned I have other grants as, as well as a designated state entity um, for the state broadband data and development grants, also administered by NTIA. Uh, last year, they allowed. They had some supplemental funding for adoption. Um, and so we were able to take advantage and receive funding for statewide, two statewide initiatives, which we're really thrilled about. Uh, the first one is for to provide technical assistance to small businesses and nonprofits who uh, serve or are themselves uh, members of the vulnerable populations that Larry talked about, the uh, elderly, uh, disabled, low income. Um, and working with the community development Development Corp in in Massachusetts, we will select 40 small businesses and nonprofits to help them either adopt the internet into their their business or adopt digital literacy training into their the nonprofit programs that they that they run today. Uh, and then the second grant uh, was a grant to. Um, uh, encourage or increase the, uh, the usage of the internet by building out an application. And so we have, uh, we receive funding in collaboration with the Department of Veteran Services here in Massachusetts to build a veterans portal. And we chose the, the veterans community because they cross all the demographics. And some of the things that, that we, we know is that um, it's very, very complicated to understand all of the, the benefits that, uh, that, that are, you're entitled to as you come back, whether it's understanding the GI Bill, whether it's understanding based on your rate of disability, um, what level of benefits that, that you get. And uh, we recently had a, a design charrette uh, over at the Microsoft Nerd Center, which was just a fascinating place to, to bring. We brought uh, together 40 to 50 um, veteran service providers and talked to them about what would be most helpful to these folks that aren't getting on the internet and don't know that even what their benefits benefits are. And so later this fall, we'll be rolling out this, this portal um, that will really be a one-stop shop for veterans in Massachusetts and their families because we know that um, uh, disabled veterans or veterans coming back with from the wars with traumatic brain injury, injury or post-traumatic shock, they aren't self-selecting, gee, I have this injury. Um, and so they're not getting the help they, they need. So family members are gonna be able to go on and access this information and get connected with the service organization and, and get the help. And so uh, we're really thrilled on having the funding to, to be able to do that and we know that We'll, we'll target, uh, we have uh, several soldiers' homes here in, in Massachusetts where there are, there are aging veterans. Uh, we, we have plans to go out and work with them and create a community environment so that they can uh, not feel so isolated as we, as we, we hear and know that they, that they do. So we have lots of efforts going on, both from, uh, you know, I have a hard hat where sometimes I'm out uh, looking at uh, utility poles and, and stringing the fiber, um, and other times I'm, I'm engaging in, in 
adoption, and uh, it really is both both those sides and both both pieces are, are equally important. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. Um, now as we turn to our other three panelists, each of them are involved in one way or another with sustainable broadband adoption or public computer center projects that we're funding. Um, and before I bring our next speaker up, I would like just to acknowledge a key member of my staff who's here today, uh, Laura Breeden. If Laura, wave your hand. Laura uh, manages and oversees all of our public computer center and sustainable adoption projects. So she's a very, very key player in all of this um, in terms of uh, ensuring that these projects deliver the benefits that they've promised to the citizens of the communities that they're in. Um, and so I'd like to bring up next uh, a representative of um, our Michigan State project. Um, this is Jenny Lee with Allied Media Projects, which is a partner with Michigan Michigan State in, a, in about a five and a half million dollar sustainable broadband ad adoption project we're carrying out in Michigan. Um, Jenny also uh, was a key person in organizing this panel, so um, I'd like to bring her up and let her fill you in on what's happening in Michigan. Jenny. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I work with Allied Media Projects, and we are a member of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. There's a handout that was passed around that you can refer to for some more detailed information about our project. Um, but I just wanted to start off by asking, by a show of hands, how many people in this room saw the imported from Detroit Chrysler commercial during the Super Bowl this year? Oh, almost everyone. OK, great. So people in Detroit were. Um, you know, had mixed feelings about it, but in large part, I think a lot of people were excited because the commercial um, merged Detroit's legacy of creativity with our legacy of labor. Um, it presented Detroit as hard hit, but resilient and full of dignity. Um, where it fell short, I would say, and a lot of people founder and publisher of the Michigan Citizen, which is a community newspaper that's been lifting up examples of that um, grassroots activity for decades. Um, so when the Stimulus Act passed, including uh, BTOP written into it, thanks in large part to Free Press and um, many of our allies in DC, we in Detroit saw it as a tremendous opportunity because we understood how increased broadband adoption was integral to the success of all of these uh, diverse grassroots efforts. We formed a coalition called the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition to write a citywide BTOP application. And we went through a year-long needs assessment process um, working with groups across the city to really hone a vision that reflected the many diverse communities and our needs in Detroit. And the handout that you have explains those programs um, in detail and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about them on the rest of the panel. Um, but I wanted to just take a minute to say that the, you know, once we reached that point as this uh, deeply rooted coalition of grassroots organizations, what we were missing was an institutional partner um, who could help us interface with the state and federal uh, government agencies. And so I actually attended a workshop by the NTIA um, leading up to the round two BTAP deadline last year um, in which Assistant Secretary Strickling uh, was moderating a panel with uh, some of the successful applicants from round one, including a professor at Michigan State University named Kurt Dimage, uh, who had written a successful grant and was talking about the, um, the plans that Michigan State had for doing a uh, broadband adoption proposal for round two, focusing on our Michigan so-called cities of promise, so Detroit, Highland Park, Hamtramck, um, many of our most hard, hard hit cities. And so um, we had a conversation immediately following that workshop. I introduced myself to him, and we were able to identify this um, Th what we both had to bring to the table, which was Michigan State as a large institution, their uh, capacity and political relationships, um, which were really important, but at the end of the day, they didn't know how to go about um, running a successful broadband adoption program in Detroit because they didn't um, know how to navigate those relationships within the many complicated uh, institutions of our city. And so we were able to have that successful partnership, and I think that's key in thinking about um, the future for work like this to continue without federal funding. I think it is going to rely on these types of large institution um, partnerships with grassroots 
formations that um, that really honors and respects the leadership that exists at the grassroots in our cities. Um, and so from a, a year from then, um, here we are today uh, having launched uh, these six interlocking components of our program, which are uh, a training for 50 digital media educators and entrepreneurs called the Future City Media Workshops. Um, a year-long teacher professional development training, uh, working to infuse digital media arts into the core curricula of our schools. A growing network of youth media organizations who are partnering with local businesses in Detroit to improve their online presence. Um, an online platform, uh, which will be um, a marketplace for all the digital media trainings and services that come out of our programs. Um, a network of 12 computer centers in non-traditional anchor institutions supporting digital literacy programs and neighborhood-based mesh wireless networks. And finally, a comprehensive documentation and evaluation system um, with support from the Open Technology Initiative of the New America Foundation so that we can ensure the uh, evolution and um, you know, that the story of our work is properly told. Um, and so uh, we look, yeah, we're excited to have this conversation with our allies and um, partners who also received BTAP work. And the last thing that I'll say is that Detroit really is a unique situation because we are literally in the process of rebuilding our economy from the ground up. Um, and we can't, for that reason, we can't isolate broadband adoption from the question of how we will transform our schools or how we will create safety in our neighborhoods without police. Um, in this way, Detroit offers lessons for the rest of the country because the solutions that work in situations with the most scarce resources and the intersecting social crises that we're experiencing are ultimately going to be the more holistic and sustainable solutions that can work anywhere. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Brian Mercer with the Media Mobilizing Project in Philadelphia. And Brian's a partner in, with two of our grants in Philadelphia, a public computer center grant uh, to the city of about $6.4 million um, and an $11.8 million grant to the Urban Affairs Coalition for Sustainable Adoption. Now, um, since this is on videotape, I wanted to have this memorialized forever. Um, Brian uh, and the entire Philadelphia uh, program ran a kickoff on Martin Luther King Day back in January, and they invited uh, up to Philadelphia our chief of staff, Tom Power. Um, and somehow the wires got crossed, literally, because they had Tom uh, sit down and actually help refurbish a computer, which was part of the program that I'm sure Brian will get into. Um, Brian reported to me, um, and this is an absolute fact, right, Brian, that that computer blew up after uh, um, Tom Power left. And so I wanted to have this on videotape so that uh, there will be no doubt about that uh, when we try to resolve this uh, controversy in my office when I get back next week. Um, in any event, of course, that none of that happened. He, well, he did try to fix the computer, but the, the blowing up part, that's apocryphal. Um, in any event, let me uh, ask uh, Brian to come up and tell us a little bit about what's going on in Philadelphia. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen to the different parts of that computer after. <laughs> um, so, good, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to speak for. You're, you're okay. Yeah, I just want. Good morning. Um, <laughs> just wanted to speak for a few mi minutes about the the project in Philadelphia. Um, some of the some of the exciting vision that we see coming out of the project, and also some of the. Um, the roots and directions of it and where it's going. And I think, you know, one thing that I'm hearing um, across the panelists, and we find this very true in our work, is that access um, to the internet and broadband adoption is so interconnected with the, the merit of issues around poverty in this country. Um, and that 
what we're seeing really up close is that um, solutions to the troubles of access are also about solutions to the troubles and problems of poverty. Um, and so Media Mobilizing Project um, became involved um, in this work around broadband access through really understanding that connection and seeing that connection in a real way. It makes me think of the story of um, a high school student that I know, Othello, who um, came into her high school day after day, had assignments to, to do homework um, on the internet, but not having access to the internet at home, um, not having access to the internet in her high school. Um, and through that experience, um, she got together with other students and and organized together to find a way to put computers um, in the library at her, her high school. Um, and I think that stories like that are, are, tell so much of one, how important access is, um, two, what it means to, to, um, to organize around access and how these issues of access um, really don't stand alone. They're not isolated. They're issues that are so connected with the, the success of, of students to um, and so solving the issues around poverty. And so um, at MMP, at Media Mobilizing Project, what we believe is that uh, movements begin with the telling of untold stories. And that stories like Othello's are stories that need to be told. Um, and that uh, a great way to drive forward this broadband program is to tell those stories and, and make it possible for people to be telling those stories through, through adopting the internet. Um, and so, I guess just on, on some of the history of Media Mobilizing Project, we worked with a number of groups to, to lead a process to form a digital justice coalition, um, much like the one that uh, Jenny was mentioning in Detroit, to form a digital justice coalition in Philadelphia to bring together a number of organizations um, that ultimately led to the creation of the, the Freedom Rings Partnership. And the, the Freedom Rings partnership, as Larry was mentioning, um, was, was successful in, in proposing uh, two projects, one for public computer centers and one for sustainable broadband adoption, um, totaling a, over $18 million or so of investment into the city of Philadelphia um, at a time when the city of Philadelphia is seeing so many other areas like areas of education um, lose investment. And so really trying to look at how this investment in Philadelphia can, can be leveraged to solve a number of problems that we're experiencing in our city. Um, and so what the, what the project looks like in Philly, what the Freedom Rings Partner Project looks like and what we're doing through a media mobilizing project and across all the partners is, um, one, we're creating 77 computer labs. We're creating and improving um, 77 computer labs and mobile labs throughout the city, um, really targeted in the areas of the city with the most need, where people need access. Um, we're, we're training over the next two years 14,000 people in um, and basic computer skills um, and the, the resources they need to adopt the internet um, and even in media production. Um, and uh, we're running an awareness campaign to reach um, 100,000 plus people across our region on the importance of why access is necessary. Um, and the, the kickoff to that awareness campaign was what Larry was mentioning, that MLK, uh, Martin Luther King Day event, um, through a partnership with the Martin Luther King Day of Service. And, you know, I, I think we're, there's a lot of big numbers today, right? It's hard to really put those numbers into context and to have a picture for those numbers. And some of the things that, that um, give a picture to these numbers for me is the, the AIDS library at Philadelphia Fight, um, where people living with HIV and AIDS um, are able to access health resources that are necessary for their survival. And the, through supporting a computer center at a location like that, um, you, we're supporting the, the, the health and well-being of, of people around the city. Um, thinking about programs like um, what happens to prisoners when they reenter society um, and people coming out of, out of the jails and actually having the skills and tools that they haven't had access to for years and that the, thousands of the people who are being served in this program are prisoners who are reentering. Um, or or new, American, uh, new Americans, people 
who are in this country for the first time and learning how to speak English um, and that these computers and these programs serve people so that they are able to build strong communities right here um, in our country and be able to connect with their communities back home. Um, or youth being able to make their own media. Um, and so Othello, like I was mentioning, creating a radio piece about what's happening in the Philadelphia school system. Um, I think the other piece about this project is the, the significance of the scale. Um, and it's something that is really new for Philadelphia. Um, it's, it's really exciting for Philadelphia. It's, it's challenging us and it's forcing us to break out of old patterns and really create a new way to, to run our city. And so um, the city of Philadelphia itself is a key partner in this project. Um, the free library system of Philadelphia, which runs over 50 libraries throughout the city, is a key partner in this project. Um, universities like Drexel University and the community colleges are key partners. Um, the Urban Affairs Coalition, which represents and is an umbrella for um, hundreds of nonprofits in the city um, are, are a key partner. And then community-based organizations, community-based organizations like ourselves, like Philadelphia, um, Philadelphia OIC, Philadelphia Fight, um, that have been doing work not only in this sector, but in other sectors for decades now and are really bringing their expertise to these new challenges and problems that we face. And so I think just to, to wrap up my kind of opening points, um, what I'd like to um, leave with is just some of the vi vision and some of what we find really exciting um, coming out of the, 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 the work that we're doing on the ground and, and the experiences that we've had to, to get to this point. And I think one of the pieces that's most exciting is really integrating technology as a part of existing organizations, right? That this partnership um, that these groups coming together is actually creating a new space for how organizations are effective in what they do. And so that might be a labor union being able to really strengthen its membership and strengthen its base and people that they're reaching. That might be a community development corporation that's now able to, uh, to support business associations across um, their area of the city to, to revive their small businesses. Um, and I think that through putting technology in places that already exist through community organizations that are committed to what's happening um, in their communities is actually creating something new of how that, that, com that community is gonna grow. Um, and I think another piece that's significant is we're creating kind of new ways to solve problems, ways that are community oriented and not just individual oriented problems of um, why someone doesn't have broadband access. Um, that if we're going to solve the problem of broadband access, we need to not just start with the individual, but start with a whole community and take a whole community into account of um, how we create inroads for access, inroads for adoption. Um, and finally, I, and I think this is really important, redefining what public-private partnership means. Um, and, and saying that public-private partnership is actually a lot more along the lines of the type of partnership that we're, we're cultivating in Philadelphia. It's a partnership where um, the, the city is a main actor, where um, small nonprofits are main actors, where community groups are main actors, where education institutions and the private sector are main actors and are able to come to a table together and really work across the uh, challenges to, uh, to be able to create real lasting solutions. And so I'll leave my remarks with that. Thank you, Brian. Um, our cleanup hitter, before we get to our panel discussion, uh, comes from the West. Uh, Laura Eford is the Vice President and Chief Community Investment Officer at Zero Divide. Uh, Zero Divide received two grants uh, from our program, uh, one specifically focused on um, tribes in the San Diego area, the other a, a much more significant in terms of geographic scope project uh, covering a number of western states uh, looking at sustainable broadband adoption in places like Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, um, California and the like. Um, so uh, Laura, uh, you will be our final speaker before our Q&A. Thanks. 
Thank you. Good morning. The best thing about going last is actually hearing everybody else and just really seeing the commonalities uh, of the programs in terms of, you know, our approaches, our philosophies around how, you know, really the adoption of technology affects so many other things in people's lives, the pro private public partnerships or public private partnerships, all of those things. So, um, so I feel like I'm in the best position. It was great. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about Zero Divide and what we're doing with the, um, our BTOP grants. So Dear, Zero Divide is a foundation based in San Francisco and we work on um, really helping low-income and underserved communities leverage technology for increased economic opportunities and civic engagement we've been around for about 12 years and our name is zero divide because we really believe that you know the digital divide is part of a number of other divides in our society as kind of Brian was talking about you know it really is part of poverty it's about the economic divide the educational divide the media divide all of those things things are impacted by the technology or digital divide. And so um, so we've been doing this work for quite some time and um, and we have uh, two programs and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them and then I'm going to tell you a little bit why we decided to, to get into this, uh, I I into the federal effort. Um, the, first, the first program is a, a program that's focused on um, 18 uh, Native American reservations that stretch down from, if any of you know California, from Riverside County all the way down to um, the San Diego border. And the, it's called the Tribal, which is in partnership with the tribal, tribal Digital Village. They have a wireless network that connects all of the uh, Native American government offices, um, library schools, and all of that. And we've been helping them actually deploy their wireless networks to the residents. So the BTOP funding is actually helping us um, do some adoption activities, helping the residents there learn how to use a computer, know how to connect to broadband, know what to do on the internet. Um, some basic internet skills or broadband skills and then also some more sophisticated skills around media production and being, being able to produce their own content and distribute that through their wireless system. And so um, that project is, um, is based in, um, again, Southern California. The other project, which we call Generation ZD, is a project that does expand over um, six states until um, basically this federal grant. Um, Zero Divide was limited to working in California, our original uh, seed capital that was given to us um, limited us to California. But with this federal opportunity, we actually were able to take um, and a lot of the similar work we've been doing in California and find partners across these six western states who were doing uh, similar work. And we decided to focus on um, programs that were specifically looking at uh, digital media skills and content production with at-risk youth. So low-income, at-risk youth who don't have access to broadband at home, may not even have it in their schools, but have the ability to access broadband in these different community centers after school programs and learn um, not only how to distribute their content via broadband, but actually how to create that content. And the goal really was, or really is, to, to teach them the skills so that they'll improve um, their educational um, opportunities as well as their economic or job opportunities for the future. As as well as being basically becoming you know broadband users for life right they really are I mean they're, they're going to need to to have this connection um, really for the rest of their life to be able to um, continue the work that they're learning in these organizations um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the programs but I just wanted to swing back a minute to tell you why uh, we got into the idea of um, doing this work and, and applying to the federal government well, one is that we were doing this work out in California, so it was, it was so, I just can't emphasize this enough. It was so great to see federal leadership on this issue. Um, because we had never worked in these other states before, we had to do a lot of outreach to figure out who were the best partners in these states. And I cannot tell you how many times it was we went out to these states, what we heard was, oh yeah, there used to be a program that did that, but they're shut down now. Or there used to be an end power here, but they're shut down now. I mean, you know, the, the lack of federal leadership in this area for, for such a long time, we saw that impact on the ground as we were trying to find programs to work with. And so, you know, I just can't emphasize that enough that, you know, having these federal dollars, even if they don't 
last forever. I, I think just having the federal leadership energize, you know, a community or communities across the country that were continuing to try to do this work and, and gave us a good, a, a nice boost. And then, so for us, we really um, saw the federal opportunity as, as um, a way to aggregate smaller nonprofits that could not apply for the funding themselves. Um, and, and so that, that we would be able to bring our resources to bear to help do the application and all of that kind of stuff, to really leverage our funds that we had um, to do the match, because we knew a lot of these smaller programs wouldn't have that match. And then for us, frankly, to expand the network of, of of communities we were working in um, so that we could take a lot of the lessons we were learning in our programs in California and either export them out to these other states or learn from them and, and, and bring more learnings into the grantees that we already had in California. Um, so that was really really our, our what we saw as this great opportunity. Um, let's see. And so I wanted, oh, by the way, there's a little handout that has a description of our program. And I'm focused, I focus specifically on our um, Generation ZD program, our digital media program. But um, some of the things we're trying to do there is, is really um, help these young people gain economic and educational skills through broadband applications and work with the programs not only to, um, not only to support the work that they're doing, increase the number of young people they can reach, but also to build their capacity to become more sustainable in their community. So this gets to the question of sustainability. So what we're trying to do is identify ways that as they uh, continue to work with uh, technology training, identify ways that the organization itself can create earned income streams and then be able to bring that money back into the organizations. We've done this with about five youth media programs in California, and so we're looking to the BTOP grantees that we're working with to see who has that potential, because technology is, all gonna, is always going to change, and you're going to need that technology resource in the community to really continue to train people on, the, on, on how, to, how to really um, leverage that technology for their economic, educational, and civic engagement, and all of those kinds of things. So um, we want those organizations to be sustainable and continue the work beyond on the BTOP grant, so that's one of our main focuses. Um, a couple of things about what we're what we're experiencing and what we're learning. I think our our challenge um, is really balancing that grassroots, bottom up approach that you know both Brian and Jenny talked about um, with the idea of scaling. Right, so I'm really challenged by that because we really believe that each community is different. You, there's a there's a different culture there. The people approach things differently, even technology, and there are different things that you have to kind of take into consideration. So how do you make sure that those programs are kind of culturally appropriate for that community? But yet we can also achieve a level of scale across these programs um, so that we're reaching more people. And how can they learn from each other? So part of it for us is really building this group as a network of folks that are learning from each other, sharing their experiences. Um, so I think that's, that's one of our, um, that's really one of our, our major challenges that we're facing. So I'm just going to leave it there. I know there's lots of, uh, there'll be a lot more time for discussion and adding other points, but I um, just wanted to share that about our program. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks to all our panelists. Um, we were, we'll take questions from the audience in a minute, so be thinking of things you want to ask. And as I look around, I see we've got some really important experts in the field sitting in the audience who easily could have been on this panel as well. So we look forward to engaging any and all of you in, in our discussion as we continue. And as you hear things uh, being mentioned here that you want to add your own thoughts to, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, uh, uh, we'll add you to the discussion. Um, I, I want to come back in a minute to this whole issue of, of the partnerships with other organizations and, and specifically public-private partnerships in terms of how they may help. But, but before we get to that, um, one of the things that we have a, a challenge doing in Washington is really bringing these projects down to a human level. And really, um, I, I really like Brian's you know, reference to telling the untold stories. And I guess I'd like to give each of the, of the opportunity. Do you have a success story right now in terms of how your project has really had an impact 
impact on a, an individual or a family or just something to really help people understand that this really is changing people's lives or has the potential to do that. And we really need to be out telling those stories as we um, explore bring it down to home in terms of the power of all this federal money uh, actually benefiting our citizens. So anyone want to, does anybody have a really great story to tell about their project so far? Just grab the mic and jump in. All right, Judy. I actually shared this with, with Larry. Um, it's not what our project has done so far because we're just stringing, stringing wires, but um, uh, I had an unfortunate incident happened yesterday which brought home the power that uh, that broadband can bring in um, rural health. Um, my 85 year old aunt uh, suffered a stroke yesterday uh, here uh, just outside of the Boston area and she was able to get to the hospital and receive treatment uh, within uh, a two hour window um, and the, the, the treatment that she received has uh, reversed the impacts of the stroke within six hours. She, had, uh, she was, was unable to speak and was paralyzed on her, her right side. And uh, six hours later, she was, I mean, she was able to speak and move her, her extremities. And one of the things that we know with, uh, with broadband in rural communities is the, the, tele, the importance of the telehealth aspect. And we know there are organizations uh, that have implemented uh, telestroke programs where uh, a rural community which may be 10 hours away from a regional hospital where there's a neurologist or somebody who can accurately diagnose this, um, this condition uh, can go in using video conferencing over uh, wireless, um, uh, share the, the CAT scan, um, uh, visually see see the, the patient and make that, that diagnosis uh, from a regional hospital uh, 10 hours away. or And it really brought home to me yesterday the, the real importance of that. My aunt, if she didn't have that, that option, she would have been paralyzed and unable to speak. And her quality of life would have severe, been severely d diminished. And, you know, uh, luckily she was, didn't, you know, she had access to that, but all citizens deserve the right to have access to that, to that health care. And, you know, that's one of the things that we know, building out this infrastructure in the rural areas and what we're doing throughout the country uh, will bring that to bear. So thanks for allowing me to share that. Yeah. Others? Jenny. Sure. Um, we launched the Future City Media Workshops in early, sorry, late February. Um, as I'm sure everybody on the panel knows, it's been breakneck speed since receiving the awards to actually implementing the programs. And so when we put that application out into the world, uh, we had, I think, uh, just under two weeks to get all of the participants in our program that we needed. We had 50 slots um, for you know these people who were going to go through a program of gaining skills in advanced digital media uh, literacy as well as digital media education and digital media entrepreneurship. Um, so we were sort of, oh, are we going to be able to get all 50 slots filled? Um, within 10 days, we had over 200 applications. And then by the end of the, the window, we had 238 applications for 50 slots. And the, um, the participants that we have accepted in the program, um, they had to answer questions about how they saw uh, broadband technology advancing their ideal future for the city of Detroit. And so we have um, in our classes um, a 16 year old who dropped out of high school and is using graphic design um, to, uh, as a, a first step in launching um, some of his own entrepreneurial activities. We have a 65-year-old um, laid off uh, um, worker. We have a range of, of people from all throughout our community who are um, gaining these skills to transform their own lives as well as um, their communities. Yeah, and I think it's a lot of the just little things that really stand out and are actually really significant. Like when someone is able to sit down at a keyboard and 
know how to adjust their posture so that they're a lot more comfortable. And you can just see the expression change on their face, like, oh, I didn't know that's how I could do this. And it feels a lot better, and I can actually do this. Or um, someone who is, is, a, is a cook for their, their day job, and you know people love the food that they make, and then they have the opportunity to like find more recipes and do more with what um, they already do throughout their day. I mean, I think those little things are really significant, and we're seeing a lot of them right now. And I, I'm really excited about the kind of six months, a year out, throughout the future. What is this? You know, what are those little things really going to amount to, and and how? What lessons will we learn from all of that? Um, but I think the the expressions on people's faces and how those expressions change, just in interacting and having a space to talk about these things, is is really huge and impactful. So our programs are just getting going. So I'm going to, but um, I'm going to talk about a, a project that we're funding and, and some work that they have been working on. Um, but I think it demonstrates the kind of continued success they're going to have. Um, we're actually funding a project in Hawaii, and um, there's a group. Uh, the the work that's being done there through Akaku, which is the uh, community media access station there, um, they're training youth on the island of Molokai, which is actually one of the smaller islands in Hawaii. Very rural community, primarily. Native Hawaiian population, very low income. And actually, and you, you all from rural areas and other states may experience this too, but um, um, alcoholism is, is, a, is a big problem, and drinking and driving is a big problem, and, this, and the roads are actually not that great. You know, Hawaii's um, built on ho you know, mountains, and so the roads are very mountainous, and it's, it's difficult. Um, and so there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of um, deaths um, because of traffic accidents for young people. And so this group made a film, or your digital video, around um, the dangers of um, drinking and driving. And it was actually, they showed it to us, and it was actually pretty, you know, it was actually pretty good. It was pretty well done. I mean, it looked like it was almost professional. And um, they've been distributing this throughout the state, and, this, and um, really um, trying to impact how young people uh, think about the responsibility of, of driving and not drinking during that time and um, and, and it's hard to share that impact without having the video here um, but but to the point where the state of Hawaii and the county of Maui is actually looking at making it mandatory for everyone who goes through traffic education but I, I think having you know the, the broadband connection to be able to then distribute that video impacts not just their community but it has the potential to impact communities all around the country so we, uh, each of you has talked about training in one fashion or another, and, and certainly um, our research, the census research, shows that the one reason people give more often than any other reason for not subscribing to broadband is that they, they don't see the value of it, which we think is really probably code for. They don't understand the technology or don't know how to use it. Um, each of you has had to deal with this issue of training people in one fashion or another. And I, I guess the question I would have for you is, you know, what are the elements, the key elements of a successful training curriculum? Are there any particular surprises you've had as you've put these together. So for example, I know Michigan State has reported that um, while they're focused on digital literacy, they're finding that basic literacy skills are uh, in quite a deficit situation when the communities they're working in, and they've had to adjust to deal with that. But um, in general, you know, for folks that are thinking about how to, how to organize and create a digital literacy program, what are some of the things that you would recommend have to be part of that and some of the pitfalls to avoid? Maybe Jenny, you should start since I called out Michigan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that issue, we've definitely encountered that as well. And, and reaching out to the populations that we know need to be at the heart of this program, we've um, <clears throat> our classes contain a really wide uh, range of skill levels and um, and learning styles. So, in in fact, one of our um, instructors is actually um, has a learning disability himself and has been. Um, helping the other instructors design their curricula to be able to um, make the, the content accessible to people um, who may be more visual learners, more audio learners, more um, tactile learners, and all these different ways. So we're, we're working through those challenges, and we know that that's what it takes to, to lift up the, um, 
the, you know, the skills and resources of our whole community. And one, one way that we're doing that, um, because the, the classes contain people, you know, like an audio class might have someone who's been um, doing sound engineering on their own musical projects for years and someone who's only ever used, you know, a free program like Audacity to, um, to edit a little sound clip for the organization, and so we're um, creating more peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. Um, you know, not expecting that the, the the instructor will be the sole bearer of of all the knowledge in the classroom. Creating um, more opportunities outside of the the uh, specific class time for people to be collaborating on projects. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the question of how how we're making um, broadband adoption relevant to people who might otherwise um, not see the value is really by going to to where they're they're at in terms of the the uh, things that they're trying to accomplish within their community so for example some of our participants come from 48217 which is the, one of the most environmentally toxic zip codes in the entire country and they've been um, working for many years to um, to hold the Marathon oil refinery, refinery um, that pollutes their neighborhood accountable for a lot of the um, violations. And so um, looking at how media and technology can be tools for the organizing that they're trying to do. And there's just numerous examples of that, I'm sure Brian as well, the communities that they work with um, in, in showing how these are tools for larger community work. Yeah, I think some of the things that um, stand out and that we're seeing in the different training classes that we're a part of, um, one time, just people want more time and more of what um, we have to offer. And I think um, that's a good thing for them to be asking for. Um, I think creating spaces um, in a very similar way to what Jenny is m mentioning um, that are group oriented where people can work together in those spaces and work across um, not just um, a, the instructor or, or trainer having all the knowledge to offer, but really creating space where other people step up and offer the knowledge that they have to offer. Um, a lot of our training work happens inside of media production programs. So people coming together regularly to create a TV show or to create a radio show. And I think one of the biggest powers and strength that we see behind that is there's an ongoing training that's happening. There's, there's a constant refining and touching up of skills. There's a lot of independent work that people are doing. And that's and that's because they have uh, a group of people to really support them in that. Um, I think uh, kind of connected to this group element is understanding that there are many roles and, and many strengths that people have and really um, building on the strengths that people have, their interests in the classroom space, that not everyone will pick up everything really quickly, but to really highlight and, and bring to the front those things that people are strong on because that's what they'll continue with and continue from. Um, and yeah, I think also just treating every moment as an opportunity. Um, we use like quotes of the day at the beginning of our classes and um, we see the time before the classes as a real time to build a relationship with people and that there's just all the all the little pieces every, that every moment of of a training of a class being with people is an opportunity to to build a relationship with them and that relationship will build their interest in the technology great I, I think a lot of similar themes come up in our work as well. Um, Can I just ask, I mean, all three of you, and Judy too, are you having any problem attracting people to come in for training? Okay. I actually, um, some of the things that we know we're going to have to pay attention to with our vets portal is that um, uh, there's a the, the community of veterans coming back with post-traumatic stress um, and traumatic brain injury, uh, what they tend to do is isolate themselves and sit in in their home with and, and play video games and and as as, as they, they they folks told us and order pizza you know they just sit with the, the shades drawn and and so some of the challenges that we've been told we're going to uh, run into is getting to them and you know some of the concepts are can we work with the local pizza delivery uh, folks and put uh, a flyer in the you know on top of the box to just say hey this is available um, and and also in our other program so one of the things that we're focusing on is making sure you know sort of the birds of the feather um, 
that that we are training uh, training trainers uh, in the communities uh, in in the places where um, the 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 folks who don't adopt broadband today go on a day to day basis and trust where they go on a day to day basis and incorporating the training in, into into that. But so those are the problems right? we know we're going to have. And, and Laura, in your programs, uh, you were starting to. Re talk about specifics. What role is things like workforce training playing as part of the curriculum you need to offer? I mean, we we know increasingly, people can't even, can't find jobs without going online to see the opportunities. They can't apply for jobs anymore without going online to do it. Does that become an important component of, of the programs that you're offering as well? Yeah, it's definitely an, an important part. And actually, one of the key outcomes we're looking for is really um, beefing up people's um, job skills. So through technology. So our programs curriculum-wise, it sounds like very similar to what Jenny and Brian are doing. Uh, so everything from, you know, audio engineering to video production, as well as, you know, the more basic skills of being able to find jobs online, be, being able to, um, um, <clears throat> communicate with employers online and those kinds of things. What we find in our programs is that, you know, the young people, they don't have access at home. So in addition to the training that they're getting on media production and distrib you know, distribution via broadband, they also, they do their homework there. Um, they, um, they look for part-time jobs there. They do those kinds of things because they, they don't have access anywhere else. All right. And, and since, and this is a question of the whole panel, I mean, obviously, one of the things we hope to accomplish with these dollars is to actually, uh, in addition to training people and letting them see the opportunities, is to turn them into subscribers um, in their home because of the things you talk about. School children have to do their homework now online to stay current with their peers, which really means having this available in the household situation because you can't always count on getting that computer when you go to the public computer center. Um, uh, what are you seeing so far in terms of how we move people f and after we've trained them into actually subscribing to these services? And what, what are the challenges you see to that? Anyone? I mean, I'll be honest, we, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but I think there's uh, there are a couple of things that we're, we're looking at. One is um, in one of our programs, um, well, actually, four of our programs are actually uh, cable access stations. So they have an ability to reach a larger community beyond the the community, the, the young people that come into their their. Uh, um, their facilities, and so um, at least in one situation, part of the part of the goal is really to educate the broader community through you know the more traditional tele te means of television, but to provide some broadband training via that vehicle as well to reach others. Um, the other piece of it, and I actually was going to talk about this as part of a barrier too that we find is oftentimes you know one of the barriers is educating the parents when you're working with young people in particular, um, and you're working with communities like like the immigrant community. So we've had chances where, uh, or um, situations in which training is offered, but the kids d can't take advantage of it because the parents don't understand, and they think it's like, oh, I don't want my kid going on the internet. So part of it, I think, is a you know educating the parents, and then I think you know that translates to once you know the kids are trained, hopefully also bringing the parents along to really understand the value and, and to try to see if they can afford to become subscribers to to support their you know continued education of their child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it's it's really new, and so we'll be learning a lot over the next few months. But um, one of the past experiences that we had was seeing someone who used the internet regularly as a part of their participation, and and through participating and using the internet, it became really important. Um, at the same time, I think uh, the no amount of training is a replacement for really good infrastructure. And we need good infrastructure in our communities. Um, Philadelphia is faced with um, a duopoly around internet access, and internet access in many areas are, is unaffordable. And I think that those are real challenges that um, we have to figure out and, and move people to figure out as a part of um, their participation in these programs. And so. And I think picking up on what Brian said earlier about shifting away from an, an individual approach to more of a community approach, we're trying to do that on the level of um, subscription as well. So one of the 
uh, organizations in our network of community media labs is a transitional housing building that was formed out of a, a homeless people's union. And uh, many of the, the uh, residents of that building are children who, like you say, you need the internet to do their homework. And um, the, the director of that organization, uh, we worked with him to set up a mesh network within the building that would allow the, um, the signal, his signal to be expanded through the uh, five or six floors of the building, um, allowing him to upgrade to a business class account um, and then share that with all of his tenants so that it becomes less, that that child in, in one of the, um, the units of that building is less re reliant on whether or not their parent, you know, can afford the bill that month or is going to, you know, remember or is going to have um, that ongoing subscription and it becomes a community, uh, a service that, that they can provide as a community. And so we're exploring more and more ways for our neighborhoods to be able to provide um, these types of mesh networks that expand access um, and may inspire um, individuals who can tap into the neighborhood network to say, oh, we're going to add a node in that network. We're going to get our own account to be able to um, extend the, the range of bandwidth that we are all sharing as a neighborhood. Yeah. Now, now, Judy Bryan talked about the duopoly in Philadelphia. I know you'd love to have a duopoly in <laughs> western Massachusetts where many places you don't have a single provider, but you also are facing a different sort of an adoption problem in the sense that managing an, an infrastructure project, you need to be getting the community anchor institutions to basically adopt. What are the issues you're running into in that regard, and what are the challenges that have to be overcome there? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, um, for I think I mentioned it in my opening, uh, the folks in Western Mass know what they don't have. Um, and they were a very uh, active uh, citizenry, uh, which is great. So we don't necessarily think we're going to have challenges getting them to adopt. They, uh, they are very interested in, and vocal about wanting the, uh, the connection. Um, what I need to make sure of, uh, or I worry about, is that we, we, they stop. They, you know, they, don't, they know they don't have broadband, but we need to go beyond that. What are the possibilities, what are the, uh, that a next generation network allows them to, uh, to do where, you know, I think they're just so focused on, we don't have it, we need to get it. The, the next thing is, what can you do in terms of, uh, you know, the telehealth I, w I was talking about, or, uh, or education, um, educational either, you know, remote classrooms uh, or uh, workforce, as you were talking about, getting the community colleges to work together. Um, you know, to hold a master plumber, plumber's course where they can all, uh, you know, all view and gain access to. Um, so to, to me, it's just making sure that uh, we take the, the base level and, and, you know, continue the innovation. Now, coming back to some of the organizational discussion, um, and, and, and Judy, your project to me presents a, a, a classic case study of the challenges of trying to bring an entire area together and talking to all the, the important institutions. Um, I mean, Western Massachusetts tried for 10 years to do this themselves. And they did everything right in terms of lining up all the communities, in terms of getting the support in the area, yet it couldn't get over the hump in terms of actually getting a service provider to build out um, there. Um, and I know each of you and your projects have been dealing with, and, we, and you told us about all the different organizations and institutions, and clearly federal money is an important catalyst for bringing people to the table and talking about these things. But, you know, for the next generation of this, how do you see us, and, and I mean, us meaning all of us, able to continue a lot of the momentum that's been built up in terms of these uh, alliances that have been built in communities across organizations, both public and private, and how do we keep this moving when there's no more federal money to, to keep people at the table? Because um, I think this is really the, the challenge we all face in terms of expanding this beyond the federal money. I have the mic, so I'll just keep okay. <laughs> talking, and then I'll, I'll pass it down. I, I think it's it's through conversations like like this, whether there's an audience or or that we're all just sharing. I, I think, um, you know, uh, if NTIA can turn into, you know, not a funding mechanism, but uh, an aggregation center that helping us understand what the best practices are, and we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, you look at what every one of us is doing, uh, you know, and especially I look at, at these three folks and say, oh yeah, I, I, I need me some of that as soon as I get the infrastructure. And, and I think we need to also make sure that we're, we're uh, getting the metrics down so that we can 
catalyze and incent that that private investment to say, okay, the, the feds aren't coming up with, you know, they're not backing up with a, a money truck anymore, but look what we've done, you know, let's get some sponsorship and, and, and additional funding. <laughs> That's, that's interesting. We have the opposite problem because in some of our communities, we need that. We need the access issue solved, right? So uh, thinking back to your question about subscription, two, two of our grantees, one in Northern California, like uh, in Humboldt, and then the one on Maui, is actually looking at building out wireless networks as well because some of their communities, they're trying to reach, they don't have access. So figuring out how, how do we tap. So, you know, I was just in the session before this on kind of the wireless policy issues. So are there other federal monies that are are not maybe necessarily concentrated in VTOP, you know, or, or like, is it, you know, is it through white spaces or other mechanisms that we can get that access? And then, um, um, well, oh, the, and then my other thought was um, really um, engaging also the philanthropic community. So Zero Divide, you know, we're kind of in this space where we're in the philanthropic community, but we also operate our own programs. And so, you know, have we, one of our goals is really to build that uh, community of foundations and, and donors that really care about these issues and, and begin to take some of the work that's being done in BTOP and, and take it to that next level. And federal leadership in sort of gathering that group of people together would be great. I mean, Ford's doing some stuff on it. I mean, people are doing things on it, but I think, you know, having it as a, a specific concerted post BTOP strategy and having some federal leadership around that would be great. I, I just going to interrupt for a sec because um, unfortunately we had Karen Perry from Gates in the back of the room and Jenny Toomey from Ford Foundation was here and we could have we could have challenged them and put them right on the spot in terms of uh, responding to your point but they both ducked out before we got to that so I'll show them the video right we'll okay. show them the video and, and get them uh, but in fact I think both Jenny and Karen and some of the other foundations actually are, are have been playing a very important role the Gates Foundation uh, certainly helped uh, organize a lot of the library projects that we uh, received applications for and ended up funding the vast majority of them because uh, um, the Gates uh, affiliation really led to some high quality projects coming into us and, and Jenny at Ford Foundation has done a terrific amount of work in this space as well. But I think you're right. We need to continue to look for those kind of partnerships with the philanthropics to, to see how we keep this going. Brian? Yeah, it's a it's a great point. I, I can check that off of my list. Um, <laughs> I think uh, one piece coming from a, a, a smaller nonprofit organization. I think uh, the the actual application process um, and some of the supports way the program is structured um, could could improve how it supports nonprofit and smaller organizations and their ability to take on projects like this. I, I know of too many organizations that um, were excited about this opportunity and couldn't really engage with it and be a part of it um, just because of how, how difficult all the requirements are. Um, and I, I think that's a piece that, that's important and can be looked at and, and thought about um, and improved so that more people are able to engage in this space. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about in the process in Philly, I mean, our division of technology from the city of Philadelphia really didn't play a role outside of municipal government and technology support for municipal government. And through this project, now they play a role in public um, technology access, and and that's that's huge. It it changes the agenda of a fundamental city department, and and thing I, I think. Moves like that and, and progress like that is really important towards the long-term sustainability of this entire sector and field of work. Um, I, I also think that there's a lot to be done around the, the sustainability of individual organizations. Um, and I'm really excited about um, one of our lead partners, the Urban Affairs Coalition, and their experience and really that field and supporting local organizations and being able to um, sustain their work and, and grow um, over the long term. And I think that they'll have a lot to bring and I'm excited to see how that will play out in Philly. And I think the other piece, you know, federal funding, just as you mentioned, Larry, it brings all these groups together to, to start thinking about um, the future of their cities and, and what's happening in um, this field. And I, I think that we can do that strategic planning, um, that real long 
long-term thinking outside of the funding and that actually will put some of the plans on the table and and put some of the ideas out there um, and and make it possible to think creatively about that sustainability um, and so not waiting around for the opportunity the the funding opportunity to do the strategic planning but doing the strategic planning now um, and in an ongoing way um, which yeah I think are, are there any private companies that are partners in Freedom Rings today? Yes, actually, uh, Wilco, um, which is a, a cable access provider um, and does cable access for um, the pub public housing throughout the city. And so they're, they're privately held uh, minority business um, and have been a great partner, especially on um, direct access and public housing units. So. Have, have there been any nibbles with Comcast, particularly since they're headquartered there? Yeah, I haven't seen anything really play out, but yeah. Okay, well maybe the, maybe we can help there. Um, to reiterate what Brian was saying, uh, when we, in terms of just the process um, and not expecting the federal funding to be there, when we started out on our BTOP path, we were actually very uh, doubtful that we would ever see the federal dollars, and we were committed um, in our very first meeting of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. Um, everyone there was consensus that we were going to do this work, uh, whether or not we ever saw a federal dollar. And I think that's really important, and the only way that we can um, inspire other groups to take those paths and, and um, create these strategic plans um, and then figure out the funding as they go along is by sharing the effectiveness of our processes that we've gone through. So how do you actually bring together a diverse coalition of community stakeholders, um, do an in-depth needs assessment across multiple communities, develop a collaborative vision, and then implement truly functional systems um, you know, of programming and evaluation and documentation. And um, we... I would say we've built in to every piece, and you know, Laura mentioned this too, we've built into every piece of our program earned income strategies um, so that they're by nature going to be sustainable um, after the federal funding is gone. We're, um, one of the impetus for, for us launching the, the training of trainers program, uh, part of our, our BTAP program, was the fact that we had this um, overwhelming demand. Our organization, Allied Media Projects, had an overwhelming demand for training and digital media services. And through these programs, we're not only expanding the capacity to meet that demand, but we're actually growing the market. So by establishing these different um, community media labs who are going to need the basic digital literacy trainings, um, are going to want to go on to do more media production by bringing digital literacy programs into schools um, where we can we can tell that we're, we're really growing that market um, and we'll have uh, you know further requests um, for people to be providing these trainings and then lastly uh, Jenny Toomey was in Detroit two days ago uh, visiting our, our sites and um, we've definitely sparked the interest through the federal you know the inf influx of this federal funding we sparked the interest of a lot of um, local and national funders to be helping continue the work so that's exciting let me uh, go to the audience any questions yes ma'am uh, wait for the mic to come back to you yeah, we need it for the videotape. Thank you. Chris St. Germain, the Nez Perce Tribe. We were a successful round two BTOP applicant for infrastructure. And we are already, although not a shovel has hit the ground, thinking about sustainable adoption. Will the models in this um, effort be available, the applications, the portal, um, uh, for distribution outside of their existing projects? Um, and, and I think the answer to that is certainly we are already uh, working to collect uh, digital literacy materials, uh, not just from the grantees, but from across the country. In a, in a joint project, we're working with the Department of Education and some of the other federal agencies. And uh, um, there will be more information coming out on that, we hope, later this month. Um, in general, though, I would hope that any of our grantees would be willing to share with you um, their ideas and, and the actual materials they're using. Um, I hope I'm not speaking out of terms for the folks up here. All of that information in terms of reaching out to our grantees is on our website so you can see exactly what each project is doing. Their quarterly reports are posted there. Um, I think there's contact information available there so we encourage anyone whether you're a broadband grantee or just someone who's interested in this to reach out to us and to our grantees for more information on this. 
part of Okay. Part of the um, the award requirements is that if you produce something content with federal dollars, the federal government does have a right, non-exclusive right, to use it unless you've uh, arranged something else with the federal government. So uh, I think in almost all cases, the content, the curriculum, will be available for sharing across uh, agencies. Um, and some people have instituted a Creative Commons license as part of this. So that means when they share their curriculum or their tools, um, um, it can be modified as long as the modifications are contributed back into the community. At least that's one form of Creative Commons license. So I think there will be a lot of both materials and lessons learned that will be available. Yeah, and just to f follow up on that, because it's something that we're really committed to in Philadelphia also, I think what's exciting is seeing the, the systems that we go about doing the different aspects of the project and the processes for the different aspects of the project also being well documented and sharing that out. So we have to figure out how do you um, put a safe image on um, hundreds of computers so that those computers have the longest time span that they can be out and be usable for the public. And so making that type of knowledge really available so that the next time around, people don't have to create that wheel, um, but that those resources are out there. And I think uh, the, the team of evaluators that are working on the Philadelphia Project from the New America Foundation Open Technology Initiative um, are really committed to documenting the processes of groups, um, and I think are also a great resource to hear about how some of the different groups are going about their projects, so, in Philly and in Detroit. So. One other uh, really great resource that I'll put out there is the annual Allied Media Conference in Detroit, where uh, the Philadelphia Project and Detroit Project, and hopefully um, Judy and Laura's um, projects also will be able to convene and will be leading workshops, sharing the curriculum, um, in addition to hundreds of other groups nationally who are using you know, media and technology in these innovative ways. Um, so I would highly recommend coming. There's save the date cards up here at the table. You can come grab one at the end. And those dates would be? Oh, uh, the dates of that conference are June 23rd to the 26th in Detroit. Great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, I sir. Ha I have more of a comment. Um, I give a little Philly love right here. Um, so I'm with the Urban Affairs Coalition and we're one of the lead partners in the Freedom Rings partnership. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say, and MMP's language is really fantastic around this, is that there needs to be a movement around this kind of stuff. There ne and it's very rare that government issues money that could create that kind of a groundswell. Right? And we really do see this NTIA funding as being, in the sense it's an investment, but it also is a way to galvanize by serving 15,000 people directly or getting out the word to hundreds of thousands of people, a way to galvanize the entire city to think that this is the time that people need to get connected, right? And they need to get connected because they can get better employment opportunities, better education for their kids, better access to health care, and learn all kinds of stuff about where the world is going in the next 100 years. Now, the, the comment I wanted to make is that really requires that all of the sectors in society participate, right? And the government is participating with the NTIA's involvement, the nonprofit sector, um, to some degree the for-profit sector, but I can't say that corporate citizenship has been perfect across the board. Um, philanthropy is definitely getting involved, and academia is a huge role in what we're doing. But I think this real emphasis on asking all of the companies that provide programs that are cost prohibitive to low-income families to consider creating at least some section of programming that could give them basic access because as education moves into the digital sphere, as basic information moves into the digital sphere, even applying for a McDonald's job moves into the digital sphere, you can't expect low-income folks to have the equal opportunity and it actually creates the kind of barrier that almost is akin to what happened what people are protesting during the civil rights moment is that there, I mean, there is a fundamental barrier that is insurmountable by some factor that is somewhat out of your control. L let me ask, and this is to you and, and to our panel and anyone else. Um, obviously, we're currently focused almost single-mindedly on overseeing the construction and completion of these projects. 
But again, we have the same issues that our grantees have, which is what do we do when the money runs out? How, how would you, what would you recommend uh, the federal government role to be very specifically in terms of kind of keeping these issues going forward even after the projects get built? Uh, four specific things. Some of them are in the broadband plan and some of them aren't, right? One is that you have to have people who are committed to training people as and, and really seeing a national sense that digital, ed, like it, digital literacy, media literacy, and basic uh, child, early childhood adult, I mean childhood literacy and adult literacy are viewed as a conjoined complex of ideas that in the digital age you can overcome all three of those with one set of trainings as opposed to before you needed three different things. And that we need to really amplify the sense that the programs like the National Service Corps, like AmeriCorps stuff and, and um, work study at universities and all the different places where people are going out into the community and doing that kind of work has a core focus. On, on getting people to learn how to use the computer and to use the internet for daily life, for work, for play, for you know anything. Um, the second thing is is that there should be some sense amongst the telecoms as an industry that they're they're making they're one of the biggest growth industries in the last 30 years, right? I mean they have to make a commitment to and it's in their own interest financially. Every person who subscribes, they subscribe to what's principally a private infrastructure that they are providing. I mean, it's in their interest to promote adoption and subscription through these programs, and they should partner up with whatever BTOP programs around, community programs, libraries that are doing this work. The next thing is, is that there needs to be sustainable mechanisms from city, state, and federal funding to identify what are the conjoined complex of programs that these efforts really touch, right? So anywhere from telehealth, like we heard, to uh, literacy programs and where and 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 having local convenings at the state and um, at especially municipal levels and and kind of rural rural kind of I don't know how you aggregate those but because I'm not from a rural area but um, having some some set of stakeholders that identifies what resources are available in those environments and helps people understand how to build the partnerships with it, with the appropriate institutions across that area so that you can drive the economic development money, you can drive the health and, and you know, the med ed money, you can drive um, infrastructure money. You can, you can get a program that's cohesive in each place that's tailored to local needs and local concerns. And then the last thing is that we need to um, think about how um, we talk about where the actual infrastructure is going. Um, in terms of whether, you know, people are talking 5G, people are talking fiber, but there has to be some consistent sense of nobody knows where this whole thing is going, and so I'm not asking people to pull out a crystal ball and say, oh, it's going to go this way. But what I am thinking is that for a lot of what we're doing, it would be important to know what are the directions or the imperatives in terms of training people so they don't end up down dead ends. Or, or um, what are the ways that we can connect them in the right ways given 10 years out? Because I know there's differences even in the administration as to where these, where people think things are going. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be prescriptive. I just want to get some clear instruction. I think. All right, all right. Good list. Uh, we've got one here and one, uh, Jane, and then here in the front. Um, I'd just like to say in the looking going towards the future that I think in the whole uh, revamping of the Universal Services Corporation, there is a one really good opportunity there to look at future funding and how you fund these initiatives. There are rural health funds there already. There are also the funds there for the E-rate, all of which have been very successful. The second thing I would say is I think it's up to the states and the federal government to work with the League of Municipalities and the Association of County Commissioners and also economic development organizations to keep them up on what's going on in the state right now with the BTOP programs so that they are successful, that there are no problems with any of the funding, et cetera, and that they come out with a really good write-up about what a success this has been. So we're working a lot on that in North Carolina in keeping all the BTOP and the BIP people together and so mm -hmm. they learn from each other as they go through the process. Good. Up here in the front. And, and please introduce yourself. That was Jane Patterson from ENC, if for those who don't know her. 
Hi, um, I'm Hannah uh, Sassaman, and I work with the Open Technology Initiative, and I work closely with uh, programs in Philly, so folks like Arun and Brian, and also help with um, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. And I just wanted to, like echoing off of the, the list that Arun laid out about ways to move forward, and then partnering with things like um, E-Rate, which I think is really, really um, thoughtful especially with other libraries involved. I heard Brian say something which, which really stuck with me, which is making sure that after the program is done, that it's also about like taking on and respecting like the leadership of the local implementers who actually did that building and, and also taking direction from them on what kinds of resourcing is necessary to keep their involvement and literacy engaged because these organizations are working on such a margin that their engagement does depend really strongly on the availability of funds to maintain these programs. So I, I wanted to actually flip it back to the panel for a second, if you had anything more to add on that on any visioning that and that either the Massachusetts program, Zero Divide, AMP, or um, MMP, or others have thought about, about making sure that those programs have a stakehold in doing their own financial visioning for the future, and what kinds of patterns you think are transferable to some of the other small organizations, like Tribal Digital Village, for example, that are doing this work. Um, yeah, this, the space of the space of broadband adoption is is really central and really important for media mobilizing project. But we're also really concerned about the the questions, many questions that are being talked about throughout the rest of this weekend on the crisis of journalism and the future of journalism and what community journalism looks like. And so I think uh, an important thing that we see in, in the future with these programs is that building a higher literacy throughout communities, building um, a greater access throughout communities, also builds a groundwork for communities to participate more in community journalism and producing their own media. And that's also an exciting space for us beyond the BTOP infrastructures of what um, the computer centers that also serve as local hubs for how communities connect with each other and communicate with each other. And that's, that's an important piece for our ongoing growth, too. So um, I, I got the message that we're out of time, but, but we decide when we're out of time. <laughs> and um, so I do want to give the other three panelists a chance not only to respond to the question, but to make any you know, last concluding comments you'd like to make before we wrap up. Laura? Okay, so specifically to your question, so our strategy is to work with the seven organizations to see if we can help build an earned income strategy. We've work, we're working with five organizations in California, and some of them have been able to um, use the youth media production as a way to bring in income, either through, um, either through by getting small businesses, nonprofits to contract with them for work for videos, um, graphics, web design, all of that kind of stuff, but also by um, monetizing their content. Um, through a distribution system to be able to um, then get sponsorships and ads and those kinds of things. So we're, we, we see potential in this, at least in, in all of the seven. I don't know that they'll end up there, but we want to get at least half of them in some kind of earned income stream. So that's one way. In the Tribal Digital Village, a similar um, want to build in, a, we're building in a social enterprise mechanism, but their business model really is becoming their own ISP for that area. So they're actually, um, this is not part of the adoption efforts, but, but coinciding with that is actually their deployment of the wireless network, and they're actually going to be charging um, a nominal amount for the residents on the reservation, but also the network is extending beyond the reservation so they can get customers that way as well. Um, so those are two things. And then just to respond, um, Larry, to your question, I think that the word that came to my mind about how does, a, how does particularly NTIA deal with moving, um, you know, the, really the, the goal and mission of BTOP forward after the program ends, the thing in my mind, the thing that came to my mind was integration, right? So this is kind of, Arun kind of talked about this, right? There's so many federal programs right now that are doing, they're, they're doing the work with this money. Even National Service Corps, they already have two grants that do the Digital Literacy Service Corps that, that's a proposed in the broadband plan, but they're not recognized. It's not recognized. So, I mean, this sounds a little cheesy, but, you know, it's almost in some ways, uh, at some level, a marketing effort, right? To really, like, within the federal government, 
government get those agencies to recognize that they they are helping the broadband movement, but they don't think about it that way, right? But so it, it, there's that, but then also getting to a deeper level so that we are leveraging workforce investment um, you know, money, you're already working with education, all of those different pots that are out there to make sure that technology or broadband is integra integrated throughout. Thanks, just a, a couple of couple of things um, for our sustainability. I, I think we have a, a pretty interesting model at the uh, at the middle mile that we haven't found any other middle mile B toppers doing this, and maybe there are, Larry, but um, we. Uh, we went in and hired a network operator to run our network, and um, we're not paying them. Um, they have the right to make money on that that network by by bringing on businesses and and other uh, entities to, that they can charge reasonable rates to that we will oversee, but that uh, they pay us an oversight fee, but also we share in the revenue. And we think that's important because it it, it aligns our interest. We want we want everyone to, uh, you know, we want them to be able to make a profit as a private entity, but we want to be able to take the the revenue that comes back in and and turn it back around and help to to sustain some of the other programs that we that we have. And you know, if there ever is additional funding, I think there should be some requirement on that. I mean, what I find is a lot of these infrastructure projects are just sort of going out to solve a community. Uh, college uh, network and and not necessarily to what are you going to do in the in those communities um, and I think that's a you know that's a really important aspect um, and and again I think for for all of us it it's a matter of you know learning from each other bringing bringing together and the other element I would say is we are very active I'm a state entity. The governor of Massachusetts, this is one of his top priorities. He talks about it, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I know that, I know it's not always, you know, we have a, a great environment and I'm thankful for that every day, but for those of you who haven't figured out how to get the states involved at some levels, I, I, I really would, would try. I mean, I would, we talked a lot about the cities and about the nonprofits and about the federal government, but I really do think states have a, 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 a role here and, and, you know, m maybe not the right environment for all states, but you shouldn't just ignore them. And, and every state has uh, five years worth of money to build their own capacity, not right. not bandwidth, but in terms of building resources and personnel and that sort of thing to support broadband right. in the state. Every state's got a certain amount of money, uh, and they're funded for five years from our program. So, so I think it's fitting we give Jenny the final word. So go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, uh, agreeing with what everybody has already said around long-term sustainability, and I think for us, the health of our program, we can't really think of it without thinking about um, what it's going to take to make Detroit sustainable and Detroit's economy, um, rebuilding that in really uh, holistic and sustainable ways. And um, so we're, we're going to be supporting Supporting um, and relying um, on our our growing small business um, sector in Detroit, all of the different entrepreneurial efforts that are, are emerging now, um, we're going to be depending on the um, ability of our our school system to be visionary and utilizing the federal funds that they receive, as well as um, whatever private funding that they can get to support digital media arts integration, um, so that our young people can be preparing themselves can be prepared for uh, this new type of economy because ultimately that's the kind of sustainability that we need um, is to have the imagination and energy of young people carrying all of this into the future. Um, we're going to be looking into how we may be able to leverage the trade adjustment assistance program um, of which you know Michigan residents are some of the highest you know there's the highest numbers of participants in that um, and and um, any other um, ideas that we can gain from our allies here. So definitely continuing the conversation that we've started today um, in every possible venue. Very good. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting discussion. And, 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 and thanks to all of you for bearing with us as we ran over a little bit. Um, thank you all. <laughs>